Okay, Kian, over to you. Okay, thank you. There was a bit of dropout there, but I think we're reconnected. Uh, I'd like to welcome the 68 stroke 69 people who are reflected on the screen, give or take one or two uh, to this meeting. This is the first of a number of um, monthly meetings that um, SF will be organizing with editors over the next uh, year or so. Um, and before I hand over to the speakers, uh, let me just give some background to the SF scholarly publication committees, uh, as many people are new and perhaps even for the old hands, it's not quite clear how these all interact. Um, SF services the, the publication sector through firstly, the Committee for Scholarly Publishing, um, of which I'm the co-chair. Then there's the National Scholarly Editors Forum, known as NSEF, uh, into which you are now invited uh, as new and or continuing members. And then thirdly, the National Scholarly Book Publishers Forum. Um, ASAF is tasked by DHETS to undertake regular assessments of South African journals, to monitor international best practice, uh, to consider new applications for accreditation, and to advise on policy and to conduct research and publishing. I must point out that ASAF is not a regulator, but it acts as an enabler of the research environment. And this particular webinar follows a survey conducted by the scholarly publication unit uh, that generated many questions from editors. And we'd like to interact with editors much more intensively than previously and to create a consultative environment whereby editors discuss and can shape national publication policy. In other words, what is learned by editors in implementation and how can we make it work for us universities and the research economy. Before handing over, um, let me have a look at some of the benefits, the successes, the threats and the weaknesses of the DHET scheme, which have been very tightly examined over the past 10 years uh, by, the, by Crest based at Stellenbosch working in conjunction with the Department of Higher Education and Training. So the successes as uh, Crest Chris Johan Mutan has shown um, over the past decade has catapulted South African scholarship onto the global stage. And it has helped protect also against capture by the predators first experienced during the same period. Uh, and the operation of the, of the scheme is for government undeniably cost efficient. This is the one scheme with, where the funds do get to the beneficiaries rather than being absorbed by its administrators. Some of the weaknesses, however, are that editors and publishers are excluded from the DHET publication value chain. Incentives, as we know, are banked by everyone except those who through their mostly pro bono work facilitate the transfer of 2.5 billion rand annually from DHET to universities. There's an assumption out there that publication just happens. We all know that that's not the case. There's a lot of hard work that goes into it. And the result is that many universities fail to acknowledge in their performance contracts the extraordinary work done by editors and peer reviewers. So astonishing is this lack that our institutional reward system, um, in, our inst in our institutional reward system, that ASAF has generated a statement on the need for editor and reviewer recognition. And a draft was recently circulated to the forum uh, and the compilers of that draft are currently um, updating it with regard to editor feedback. So it should be issued fairly soon. The other threat, the other weakness is that the reviewer pool has contracted just as the author pool and new journals have expanded. The question is, are there sufficient reviewers to service, often without remuneration, the growing number of articles that demand a place in the sun. And then finally, which is something that was mentioned in Vilan Givers' uh, report 12 years later, published about five years, five or six years ago, is that too many journals are cluttering the environment. These dilute resources and may even fail. 
do we really need more journals in law, education, and religion than there are, in fact, universities in the country? Okay, the threats, the scheme has resulted in a national research economy in which universities have become dependent on DHET funding rather than leveraging it as a developmental initiative. We need to get back to the latter. And DHET was never intended to exclude authors from institutional recognition where authors are addressing readerships rather than output income targets. We mute our international profiles when universities refuse to acknowledge outputs in non-accredited journals. DHET also is not supportive of fully employed researchers claiming funds as taxable take-home pay. That breaks the spirit of the intention of the legislation. So institutional emphasis on output targets rather than on social value and impact is considered a distraction. So the opportunities to finish on a positive note is that research planning is enabled by a futures market whereby productive authors can more or less predict income flows to plan for future research costs. So the creative use of funds, is, uh, of funds earned can be used in ways that should benefit institutions and not just the individual recipients. Uh, so this is a, a document that will circulate uh, in a slightly enlarged form after the meeting. And we'd certainly appreciate any comments, uh, suggestions or criticisms that um, editors might be able to offer on the basis of that uh, particular philosophy of publishing uh, in South Africa. Okay, the meeting, the, the, the menu is up on the screen. Um, so the next speaker uh, will be Susan Feldman, who is uh, the director of the scholarly publication program uh, at SF, uh, a program that works consistently and incessantly behind the scenes. In fact, I wonder how many of us really appreciate just how much work this program does and how much it underpins the increased publication of South African authors that is globally. Uh, so let me hand over to uh, Susan because uh, there are many questions I think that she's going to answer as she moves through her presentation. Uh, and in addition to the three that we've listed or that we received from our delegates prior to the meeting. So Susan, uh, over to you. Um, thank you, Kian, and good afternoon, colleagues. Um, I'm really grateful to see already 88 participants to this webinar. Um, I think I've, I've sort of got the boring job this afternoon and because my, my presentation will really just be on what it is. What is the research output policy? I'm sorry, Kian, if I'm just stalling a little bit, I'm just waiting for um, the host to give me some um, sharing rights. I can share my um, PowerPoint presentation, um, but, but as I said, um, I will really just address, address the research output policy of 2015 and highlight some very important issues from um, that particular policy. I'm sorry, let me just check again if I can share. Yes, I can. Um, please just confirm whether my um, slide pack is um, visible you go. Is that fine? So and I'll just get confirmation. Ina, can you just see yes. my, um, thank you yes. very much. Um, if thank I could you. just say, I'm, I'm, I'm just popping in here, yes, Stan and Louise and Yedin here. Apologies for the um, bit of interruption here. We, we had a load shedding ended and we just had to reconnect um, here. And then we also have had some Computer issues, Yarel Murphy's Law. But over to you, Susan. Um, thank you very much, um, Louise. Sorry, and now I'm just trying to advance my, uh, my slides. Now it's um, just going all the wrong way. I'm not sure why, and I do apologize. I'm so sorry. Um, 
Well, it's an upside right. world, so don't worry about it. <laughs> You'll okay. find it. <laughs> All right. Thank you. And thank you very much, colleagues, um, um, for this opportunity. And I just thought, you know, we always talk about the research of the policy as if it just, uh, well, you know, as if it just fell out of the sky. But I just thought to pause a little bit and perhaps just have a look at the historical background as to how did we arrive in 2023 with a research output policy. And I thought that's very important. Um, so higher education institutions have been funded through four formula. So higher education institutions have only been funded um, from 1953. And as I said by four formula, so the first formula was the Holloway formula, and that was from 1953 to 1977. And that was followed by the Van Baek de Vries formula from 1977 to 1983. And then the SAPSI formula came into play from 1984 to 2003. And what is still very interesting is that we're still using the SAPSI um, SESM categories, um, especially when we report our research output, et cetera. So that has been quite long with us. And then of course, a new funding framework which started from 2003 and the new funding framework um, was, was the beginning of the mergers amongst um, the different higher education institutions, which led to the different institutions we have today and also the differentiation between um, higher education institutions. All these formulas actually built on each other. They took the bad from the old one, they took that away and then they, um, reuse sort of the, the, the good points of, of the current formula in revision. But what was very interesting is the funding of journals, which took place through a bureau. And this Bureau for Scientific Publications were funded by the then Departments of Arts, Culture, Science and Technology from 1970 to 201. And the purpose of this bureau was for centralized production and marketing. But during the late 1990s, um, beginning of 2001, um, there was a whole um, evaluation of the Bureau of Scientific Publications, and it was actually closed down in 2001. Very interesting enough, 16 journals were funded through the Bureau of Scientific Publications. And because there was a non performance and the journals did not benefit by the particular system, the government actually asked a very important question, namely, um, is it fair for government to actually fund journals per se? But already in the SAPSI formula, which was from 1984 to 2003, there were some attempts to actually fund um, research output from um, higher education institutions. So all the journals which were listed in the then ISI um, Web of Science um, index, there were only a few, I think it was about eight, nine, ten journals, which were funded through the SAPSI system. Um, and then research output was funded also in, in various ways, uh, but not as we know it today. And then during the new funding framework, the first policy and procedure for the measurement of research output of public higher education institutions then were published in 2003. It was affected in 2004 and it referred to 2003 output. And then um, authors could actually claim accreditation from the then Department of Education, now known as Department of Higher Education and Training. But very interesting enough is in um, 2015, the new research output policy um, was published, which is now known as the research output policy. And there were a couple of changes, and I think of which the biggest change was actually that the accredited indexes, which I will deal with a little bit later, was not published within the actual policy, but outside the policy. So this means that the Department of Higher Education and Training can change the indexes from year to year. Um, and they do not have to wait for a new um, research output policy to be published in order to affect um, new indexes or the recognition of new indexes um, then for research output. 
So this is really and literally how the first page of the research output policy looks like. Um, if you would be interested, and I would ask that we could um, actually circulate the policy to you. This policy is open. It is on the Department of Education and Trainings um, website. Um, and the whole policy as such is very useful, I think, for editors as such. So the, pur the purpose of the research output policy is very clearly stated in the policy itself. It says it has two major um, purposes, namely the one is to encourage research productivity by rewarding quality research output at higher education institutions. So we will pause a little bit later on and just see whether this policy to date has actually contributed to the productivity of South African research output and what has happened to the quality of research output because many questions are being asked and we know as soon as monies are being rewarded or being put towards a cause, then it could very easily lead to um, perverse um, activities and um, behavior as such. The research output policy also defines um, research as original systematic investigation to gain new knowledge and understanding. And I think that's extremely important for journal editors to understand when they publish any article, that, that should be the main and the overarching objective of research output via um, a journal article or a book or a conference proceeding. It also really from the outset in the policy, it already states very clearly the peer review and the necessity of peer review. And it defines it as pre-publication refereeing. The evaluation of complete manuscripts and it must be independent experts to ensure quality. I think that's very important for editors to understand when and how the, the policy sees the peer review should happen and that it's not just parts of a manuscript. And this actually also mainly refers to books and to conference proceedings as well. That it's not only just the, the abstract that needs to be peer reviewed, or just um, certain parts of it, but that the whole a complete manuscript should be peer reviewed. I can imagine in going forward, and you might ask, it might actually cross your mind. So what happens to the open peer review processes? What happens to preprints? Um, but I just want to sort of stimulate your thoughts at this moment. But for the moment, it's actually very set and the policy is very clear. So the policy recognizes research in journals, books, and published conference proceedings. But for today, we just will focus on the journal outputs and not on books and published conference proceedings. And at a later webinar, we will pay attention to those two. We just thought not to conflate the different issues because they each are almost an animal on their own and they all have their own regulations and rules that governs them in terms of the output policy. I think what is extremely interesting is that internationally or locally um, published um, articles have the same level of subsidy. So whether you publish your article in a local journal or in an international journal, which are accredited, I must also qualify that, the same level of subsidy will be received by your institution. And I think this is a very uh, important point um, because I think as, as publishers of local journals, we sometimes feel, I think in a sense, almost inferior that our journals are not good enough and that there are actually discrimination against local journals. But I think this is very evident in the policy that it does not. Research output accreditates a certain unit that equals a particular amount, whether it's internationally or, or national, uh, nationally um, published. 
I just want to stop a little bit at this particular graph. I'm not sure or if, whether you have seen this graph before, maybe, maybe not. But this is an indication that since the research output policy from 2005, you can actually see how the research output has grown in South Africa um, because of the research output policy. So I think in terms of the first um, purpose of the actual policy, it has certainly achieved its goal, namely to almost fourfold to increase the research output um, in South Africa. The policy goes on in sort of its introductory pages and it says, and this is very important, that the department subsidizes higher education institutions, not individuals. But we know that there are some higher education institutions that do reward their authors for research output. The department is looking at this, at this and um, at the moment they're not prescriptive, but we're just wondering in going forward whether there will not be an explicit um, mentioning of this practice um, in policies um, going forward. But the policy do caution um, against direct incentivization of authors, because as said, it will lead to perverse behavior. And I will show you some later on in my presentation. So the subsidy for research follows the institutional affiliation of authors. So this is important. Subsidy for research follows the institutional affiliation of authors where the research was carried out. So the affiliation of claiming authors are extremely important. And you will see in this um, policy document, it repetitively it actually refers to institutional affiliation and cautions um, institutions not to do double dipping uh, because some um, authors actually change the institutions and that will really taint the research integrity, um, not only of authors, but of the institution itself and the system eventually. So this is a very important point. Um, editors, uh, we find also are challenged by this particular aspect. Um, in preparation of this meeting, um, it was mentioned by um, our colleagues who has input into this um, webinar is that sometimes there are two affiliations mentioned. So is that good practice or what should happen? And because the policy is so outspoken um, about it, uh, sort of the correctness of the institutional affiliation, I think that's a point worth discussing as to what is the best practice in that regard. So when there are two or more authors, um, the subsidy is then shared amongst institutions. If there's a visiting scholar, a letter from the DVC is necessary to justify and to prove that, that particular author was a resident at that institution. And that's why um, it has been claimed um, for that author um, by the institution. Again, this huge emphasis on integrity when claiming. So when you move between institutions, double claiming and the correct number of units. So you might be of the view that this is actually when we claim and that it's maybe important for the research officers. But I think for editors, this is also a very important point because how you depict a particular author in terms of its authorship of a article in a particular um, journal. It is important to be clear and open and should not have dubious or even double sort of meaning um, layout and design so that one wonders what is actually going on and, and um, where does this um, author comes from and where should it, where, what is his affiliation as such. I think that's also very important. The policy has a whole um, paragraph section um, on research integrity. And I can imagine and in going forward that this particular point would be broadened on. At the moment, it is um, 
It is really just touching and skimming the whole issue of research integrity. So it speaks about um, that the focus should be on quality research and the intention should not be to accrue maximum subsidy. In other words, no salami slicing. So research should not be cut up in different articles and then be published as such. Um, the, the policy actually warns authors and indirectly editors against this particular practice. Then it goes over to, again, the correct number of articles that should be claimed. And then again, it mentions the correct author affiliation should be indicated where the research was conducted, supported and funded. Um, and I think this point is very important because it's very subtly mentioned in the research output policy. But I think where it starts playing a role is when we, when we do the layout and the design of a particular article and when we request information from the authors is that we also indicate where the research was conducted, who supported it, um, and who funded it. And that's becoming very important when we start looking at um, metadata of particular articles and when we start participating in services like Crossref, um, then those very sort of fine points um, becomes very important for the metadata and just being open about um, the background of a particular, particular article, um, et cetera. But the point that we do miss and the one that we tend to ignore is the policy is very clear to say that the Department of Higher Education and Training might apply punitive measures. In other words, they actually might withheld the subsidy if incorrect claiming and integrity of scholarship has been compromised. And it has happened, especially in the um, conference proceedings. Um, there was a whole group of units held back um, because of, of this practice. So I really want especially new editors to ensure again that in the editorial processes and policies and practices is that research integrity and ethics are core and on the front of the work they should be doing. It is also important to perhaps notice what is being subsidized by the research output policy. In the eyes of ASIF and maybe um, of other publishers, um, which, is, which also functions beyond the research output policy, it is very important to note the following. So what is subsidized is original articles, research letters, research papers, and review articles. And editors tend to reason that Correspondence to editors, extended abstracts, keynote addresses, obituaries, book reviews, news articles, advertorials are not necessary for the journals because it is not being accredited. But if we look at the other side of this particular coin and we look at, in, uh, and we look at international um, indexes, um, in some further um, research that, that I specifically did is that I looked at which of the fields are being indexed by the accredited indexes like Scopus or Web of Science, et cetera. And all these points, um, correspondence, book reviews, obituaries are actually tagged in the metadata. So it does mean that a journal gets far more visibility and indexability um, because of that. But what we've also found in all the studies we've done in ASIP is that when you publish correspondence to the editors, obituaries, book reviews, et cetera, it also enhances the content of your actual journal and the impact and the value that your journal actually contributes 
to the world of knowledge in that particular field are so much more enhanced. So I really want to urge new editors, and we do understand that it is much more work, but in the end, one will have to consider what value does this journal actually bring um, then to the body of knowledge of that particular subject field. So subsidies are awarded to those articles that have been published. And this is a very important point. One has to look at the turnaround time on publishing articles. If you do not publish the articles fast enough or quick enough um, for the authors, it could mean that the accreditation or that the um, application for accreditation is actually compromised. Um, just the other day, I had a discussion with a journal who for two years, because of various reasons, um, has not published. And the predicament this editor actually faced because those articles were not published, they have been accepted and they've been sort of channeled for a particular issue in the particular year. But luckily, and one can go back to the um, policy if one is unsure, just to see that time interval, namely that, that um, an author can claim for its article um, of two years before. Um, so if they claim in 2023, they will claim what they've published in 2022, but the policy do allow with some motivation from the editor and from the institution why it was not claimed in, in the correct year that they could claim for the year, if it was 2022, then for 2021. But this is a very dangerous practice and one just have to be aware, especially in the system we're working in South Africa, that we as editors have a responsibility to publish on time at set times that we set, we will publish. So there are only subsidized articles in approved scholarly journals. And I want to pause a little bit also on approved scholarly journals. Journals will have to be approved or in other words, accredited by the Department of Higher Education and Training to ensure that they do receive the accreditation and then the um, subsidy as per the accreditation. So what are those approved indexes? So um, the one is the International Bibliography of Social Sciences. In short, we call it IBSS. The Clarivate Analytics Web of Science, that was in those days known as ISI um, indexes, but is now known as the CA Web of Science. Scopus, Directory of Open Access Journals, or in short, um, DOIJ. Scientific Electronic Library, that's CLO South Africa, the Norwegian List, and then the approved Department of Higher Education South African Journal List. So there are seven accredited indexes, journal lists by the Department of Higher Education and Training. And as a new editor, if your journal is not in one of these indexes, one it's should only strive to have last year. Um, can you hear me now? Louise? Oh, good, yes. Oh, thank you. Sorry. So, for the new um, journal editors, if your journal is not accredited, one should strive to get um, indexed by one of these indexes, um, that is very important. What is also important to note is that every approved index has its own criteria for inclusion. If you go to CLO South Africa, you'll find a certain set of criteria. If you move over to CI Web of Science, there's another set of criteria. These are core, they are core criteria that sort of dovetails and overlaps from each other. But very important, for instance, like the Director of Open Access Journals actually state 
as to how many articles you should publish um, in a particular year. So one will, should really affi yourselves with what are the particular criteria within a specific index. But what we're focusing on today is to have a look, see if you would like your journal to be DHET accredited. What does the policy say in terms of those criteria? Again, the policy starts with a purpose statement to say that the purpose of the journal should be to disseminate research results and the content must support high level learning, teaching and research. And I think that's a very important statement from a policy point of view. It also says that articles must be peer reviewed and must have a peer review policy. Apologies for the spelling mistake. 75% of contributions published in the journal must emanate from other institutions. And we will talk quite a lot about that today because this is a highly controversial statement within the research output policy in terms of how do you actually apply it and evaluate it and what constitutes 75% of the contributions, but we will pay some attention during this webinar. It must have an ISSA. It must be published at the frequency intended, quarterly or six monthly. It must have an editorial board, and in this policy, it was quite specific to say, two thirds of your editorial members must be beyond a single institution. It must be distributed beyond a single institution and it must have English abstracts. So I just want to reiterate, as per the research output policy, if you would like to be DHET accredited, these are the criteria that you should comply with. But very interesting in the actual policy. And that is almost as the next section of the policy, it speaks about if you want to apply for DHET accreditation, what should you do? The policy starts to say that all the applications needs to, read the, needs to reach the DHET by the 15th of June. And it also says that applications accompanied um, should application should be accompanied by supporting documentation. And I actually want to recommend if you apply for accreditation, or even if you just want to evaluate uh, in terms of the basic technical aspects of your journal, whether it is actually complying, then these aspects as well as these aspects should be viewed and interpreted together. So each journal must have a title, an ISSN or even an EISSN if you're only electronic based. It must have the publisher and publisher's address and contact details on it, very important, um, because that is also, also the, sort of um, presents the openness of a journal. When we do the evaluation of journals, we actually find quite a lot of interesting facts in who is the publisher and who does, who does that publishing house belongs to. And we often find that some predatory practices already takes place on that particular level. So um, the more open and the more transparent you are in terms of the runnings of your journal, the better for um, the evaluators to understand where your journal comes from. What's the frequency of your publication? It must have evidence of uninterrupted publishing for three years. It's quite a long period. And must say that new editors and new journals actually battles a little bit under this particular um, criteria um, as authors, to not necessarily want to write or to, to submit the manuscripts to journals who have not been um, accredited as yet. It must have an editorial policy inclusive of peer review. Editorial policy, that's a very important aspect because it really speaks to the operations of your journal is how would you govern it? 
uh, what would you do if there are some um, retractions? How will you deal with it? How would you deal with conflict of interest? How do you deal with the copyright issues, um, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then of course, inclusive of peer review. How do you conduct your peer review? So although it's just two little words, editorial policy, it is actually a whole lot of um, procedures, et cetera, and policies that need to be included um, when you submit your application. But it's also very good to have those policies and processes visibly displayed on your um, web uh, page of your journal. The editorial board, the status of the members and institutional affiliations, if it's e-only, the URL or the web address, and then of course, library holdings and downloads for electronic publications. Um, so that would really be my recommendation that one views these two um, sections within the policy actually together when applying for accreditation. So can you get removed from the Department of Education accreditation list? Um, the DHET actually holds um, the provision that it can sample journals to assess whether they are meeting criteria. And as of to, up to now has been sort of the body that externally evaluates um, for the Department of Higher Education and Training um, to see whether it has met the criteria. Um, sometimes if they have questions or there's problematic, or if there's been particular complaints, um, then we would evaluate it. But otherwise, as of evaluates new and reapplications of journals to the Department of Higher Education and Training's accredited list. Very interesting. I so many times hear researchers and research officers complaining to say, yeah, but you know that one journal on the DHET list is really a predatory journal, etc. But the policy makes provision that if an institution or an individual um, have a problem with a particular journal, it actually may submit complaints and motivation for removal to the Department of Higher Education and Training. And it may be submitted any time. There's no, no time frame um, against this particular um, allowance within the policy. And it will be reviewed during a review process. Such a journal may reapply after two years, plus the reasons for the re removal, and they must provide evidence of the corrections they have made, um, which then refers to the complaints which was lodged um, two years prior. Very important for editors, please inform the DHET of any changes, changes of the editor, the title, the frequency, the ISSN, um, ASIF also has its own list of South African published journals. We go through this process every year and um, we can see the value thereof because there are many changes over a period of a year in the life of a journal. So please remember that. So what type of questionable publication practices, which is important for editors, did we notice? So there, are, so there were editorial misconducts. There's the publishing of large numbers of articles in their own journals. Please editors, members of editorial board, please refrain from publishing large numbers of articles in your own journals. We get this so often and it is not being considered as ethical. Yes, there are times when editors can or should publish in their own journals, but again, your peer review and your editorial policies should be clear as to when editors and members of editorial boards publish in their own journals, what is the procedure? We also found that there were a number of individuals that were publishing in the same journal over and over again and in one issue, not just only one article, but a number of articles, and that there were also some publishing cartels starting to form in 
the research um, body of universities um, in South Africa. So this is quite serious. We also found some misconduct by authors. There were some guest, um, guest or gift authorships. Um, we did come um, aware of some ghost authorship and even some sales of authorships. Um, just to make a little blurb here, we will talk about GAP, um, G, GPT um, very soon uh, because this poses some serious threats to the scholarly um, publishing world, especially in terms of guests and ghosts and sales of authorships. It's just another almost modus operandi um, of authorship as such. And then just the plain straightforward misconduct by journals, uh, which we by the call by the name predatory publishing, um, et cetera, where there's some, some um, predatory um, practices, et cetera, um, going on. So those were the three sort of large broad sectors which we did discover in the studies that we have done a couple of years ago. In conclusion, the research output policy has very useful information and due dates, and one should almost, as a new editor, keep it as an information manual next to your um, laptop to ensure that if you do comply. And if there's any questions, I think the research output policy actually serves um, an editor very well. And make sure that you understand the research output policy very well. So there are two very specific criteria that editors have to comply with, which can be quite detrimental um, to your journal um, should it become apparent that um, it's not happening. So I want to urge editors in whatever operations you're busy with, being the peer review or the editorial board, um, the involvement of experts outside a specific institution is extremely important. And then of course, what we call the 75-25 rule. Also check the list at the beginning of each year because at the beginning of each year, the new lists are being released. And sometimes for some reason, these journals actually falls off these lists. Um, we even find it in the international list and they're not indexed anymore. So if you're only indexed by international indexes, please make sure from year to year that you do comply and that you're still on that particular list. Um, it does happen that they are not indexed anymore, as said, for various reasons, and strive for incremental changes in your journal. So when you start with a new journal, try to set some objectives and some priorities as to what needs to happen first, and then build on those um, changes from year on to year to ensure that you strengthen your journey. And then um, I think that brings me to the end of my presentation. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, these were the questions we received, but I'm handing over to you now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Susan. I think an excellent uh, overview. Hopefully um, you've got some detailed notes that um, we can work into uh, proceedings and, and circulate to the uh, editors in due course. Um, I think I'm gonna give Susan a bit of time to recover. Um, she's been speaking for quite a while and I think that information has been absolutely crucial. Uh, and quickly move then to the two additional speakers uh, who've got about 10 minutes each who can put things into perspective with regard to their own particular experiences. And then we'll open the, um, meeting to the floor and address those. Well, I think some of the number three has been addressed already, uh, but certainly the first question, 25%, 75% does need a bit more discussion. Um, but let's, let me hand over quickly then to Labi from Rathan uh, from UKZN, who's editor of uh, an educational journal. Labi, are you with us? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Um, Thank you for it. Yeah. Good afternoon, colleagues. Um, could uh, Suzanne please stop sharing? I just want to share my slide very quickly. Are you able to see this? 
perfectly. Great. All right, so um, I'm the journal, uh, editor of the Journal of Education. I'm also the editor of the Springer series on key thinkers in education, and also part of the editorial team for the Af Alternations African Scholarship Book series. Uh, so what I'm presenting now is um, from my experience as an editor of these journals uh, in relationship to the policy I think what we also need to understand is that there's various dimensions to policy. The first one is the policy intent. What is the intent of the Department of Higher Education to such output policy? And I think Suzanne had given quite an elaborate uh, engagement with the policy. Uh, and then uh, the idea of policy has a script or documented policy as document. So the document that you will be circulated is the actual script version of the policy intent. Um, and as you understand, you know, in terms of policy debates, uh, there are some slippages from policy intent to policy as documented and policy as interpreted and policy as experienced. So I'm going to speak to the issues around the policy as I have experienced it very quickly. And I'm just going to pick on three things. The key issues of the policy that Warren's mentioned, my challenges in respect of balancing the policy requirements and publishing articles in the journal and issues that I think need some revisions uh, to the policy or review at, as we move along in strengthening the policy that we go on. So some of the key issues uh, of the research output policy, the first one that I want to really pick up very quickly on is to encourage research productivity by rewarding quality research outputs. And for me, the issue of quality um, is quite relative. Uh, what do we understand by quality? How do we uh, measure quality, how do we uh, evaluate quality? So who const what constitutes quality as a research output? Who determines this? And who checks on this for accountability purposes? Um, so these are very um, loaded kind of questions. And I think we must have some discussions at some point about some kind of indicators of what quality is. We may have some understanding of it in our own environments, in our own context, in our own disciplines. But I think there needs to be a broad discussion of what constitutes quality outputs for it. The second issue that needs to be engaged with a little bit more is the research outputs emanating from commissioned research or contracts paid by contracting organizations will not be subsidized. This is a clear statement in the policy. And for me as a editor, I have to begin to try and understand you know, what is commission research? What is contract research? And the research is emerging out of it. Why can't it be published uh, for subsidy purposes? So that's something that we need to think about is what distinguishes quality research and commission research. Is, for example, NRF funded research considered commission research because there's funding associated with it. So these are some of the questions that we need to deliberate and engage with. Um, in terms of the pre-publication um, refereeing uh, uh, processes or evaluation of complete manuscripts by independent experts in the field, the challenge that I have as a editor and the editorial team is to determine who these experts are. So they may not necessarily be experts in a disciplinary field, they might be methodological experts or they may be uh, experts in the contextual, um, in the context in which the research or the findings are applicable to. So some discussions on what independent experts in the field means and some um, really brainstorming needs to happen in, front, in terms of understanding how we manage this. Um, we have a list of reviewers. We consider them as experts based on the, the declared specializations or areas of expertise. How do we ensure that they are actually experts? We don't normally have the CVs of these reviewers to establish the extent to which they have, or they have published or have reviewed articles, or they are actually in, in fact scholars in the particular field. And so uh, some engagements with that uh, needs to unfold at some point. So balancing the requirements and publishing articles. 
dissemination of original research and new developments within specific disciplines, subdisciplines, or fields of study is a statement that's made in the in the policy as a script, as a prescript. So the question that we really want to ask is, for example, in the recent COVID-19 pandemic, there was a flood of articles being submitted, merely reporting on what was done at particular institutions. And uh, there were very little new developments in terms of understanding emergency remote teaching and learning and all of other things associated with teaching and learning. So how do you begin to then, as editors, make a decision that there is more than sufficient publications in the area, that there has to be a point in which we say we would not publish any more of these articles? Because if we do, it then compromises the dissemination of original research and new developments. Remember, there's an end between original research and new developments. Uh, so they're not exclusive of each other. So you can have original research and you can have new developments. But these two are put together as a, a complementary uh, statements. So when and how do we make decisions about that? The purpose of the journal must be be to disseminate research and results, and that the content must support high level learning, teaching and research in the relevant subject areas. And so again, it comes to the, uh, the kind of uh, relativity of these concepts, high level, high level learning, high level teaching, high level research. Determining high level teaching, research and um, learning arises out of an article is a challenge. Um, the reviewers find it a challenge, the editors find it a challenge. And so we need to have some kind of discussions around how we manage that kind of determination of what constitutes high level learning, high level teaching and higher levels of research for it to be warranted as a publication in a journal. I've also received a number of underprepared manuscripts but they meet technical requirements, like they have appropriate subheadings, uh, they actually meet the tick boxes in your review uh, form, but there's a lack of insightfulness in his contribution. And the lack of insightfulness, insightfulness really begins to then compromise new developments, um, high level learnings and teachings. And so the amount of rejections that we get at us, as a result of this um, is a challenge that uh, editors need to engage with and, and, and address. And we also receive a number of articles like repurposing of a chapter for the journal articles, the so-called double dip, uh, dipping. And how does one begin to then um, you know, get a sense of whether an article that's been submitted has been repurposed for a journal? So these are issues that we grapple with as the beholder of the policy that we have to now implement and try and balance out um, the prescripts of the policy and what we actually experience. Um, the last thing that I really want to talk about is the issues that need to be uh, you know, given some attention for revisions. The focus on subsidy, the focus of subsidies on scholarly publishing, which refers to publications by scholars academics and experts for a niche market consistent, consisting mainly of academics and researchers, not normally students. So the question is what happens to students PhD thesis and master's dissertation? And how do we treat them as articles for subsidy? And remember the publications of it may not necessarily be an issue, but the policy talks about what articles get subsidized. And so does PhD thesis and dissertation articles arising out of that gets subsidy. The second statement, which I think, and there are many more that we need to go through. And I think part of the discussions that will unfold now will raise these things. This policy serves as a tool for the distribution of research subsidies to public higher education institutions in South Africa. So the idea was of, of the policy or the policy intent was that we be inclusive across all institutions within South Africa. But my experience as an editor is that we have a dominance 
of articles being submitted by a few institutions. And so to some extent, this tool in the form of the policy research output, policy and research output, is perhaps not receiving his intended intent. And so we should need to have some kind of discussions around how we use this tool much more efficiently so that we can try and draw in both reviewers as well as contributors to articles for our journal. I'm going to stop there and we'll have discussions as we um, engage further. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Lavi. Um, I think some very important points of principle there that um, we do need to <clears throat> address as, as we go forward. Um, I'd like to, because uh, we are running a little bit late, but I think we'll still have enough time for discussion, um, to the next speaker, Pierre de Villiers, um, who I'm sure is going to provide a much more nut nuts and bolts uh, analysis of how we actually navigate through these particular questions. So, uh, Pierre, over to you. Thank you, Kian. And uh, good day, colleagues. Uh, first of all, let me say to you all a very happy Valentine's Day for today. I tried my best to get something red or white to wear, but uh, believe you me, I couldn't find anything in my cupboard that would qualify for that. I hope everyone can hear me, uh, so let me proceed. Uh, I decided today, uh, because uh, for the past 20 years, I've been involved in both on the editorial side as an editor, uh, but I decided to focus on my other part of my work, and that is a scholarly publisher, an open access scholarly publisher. So as a scholarly publisher, we work with more than 50 scholarly journals, and certainly um, a lot of issues came up and we grapple with a lot of issues around the DHET policy. And I decided today to focus on four issues that after consultation with my staff, we decided that the following four issues are probably the most problematic ones that we are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. The first one is the accreditation of journals. Yes, we, we uh, uh, rather Susan gave a very good explanation and, and uh, uh, slides outlining the policy. Uh, Susan, there was one wording mistake that you made. <laughs> as a matter of fact, which I think is quite important, and that is dealing with the 75% issue. Uh, you said that 75% um, of, of articles must emanate from, I think, other institutions, you said, but the actual wording in the policy is multiple institutions. Now, that confuses the, the issue a little bit but I'll come to that. So the first thing is the accreditation of journals. So as you all have heard, there is a process whereby journals can apply, South African journals, and there's also an issue of what is a South African journal, because we do publish so-called international journals as well as South African journals. So only South African journals, according to the definition, can apply for uh, accreditation or inclusion in the DHET South African list. And uh, Susan has outlined all the different uh, criteria that the journal must meet. Now, the problem is that those criteria seems to be the entry into the accreditation evaluation process. There's another list of criteria which we don't know about, which is not uh, well-known or transparent to everyone, but maybe uh, the staff of, of, of ASOF can speak to that a little bit later. Um, my own feeling is that that evaluation process uh, is a bit unfair on new journals. For instance, the, the status of, of the editor 
uh, seems to be quite important. And, and then it is compared to, to people of the, of the highest standing in a particular discipline. Now, I think that is not possible uh, in the South African context to have uh, experts leading journals uh, who is in the top echelon of a discipline in the world. Uh, the other one is, for instance, uh, a question about uh, would this journal be the place where the best work in a particular discipline would be published? Now, once again, for a new journal, that is a very unfair uh, uh, question to ask. So uh, there's a, a saying in the Bible that reminds me of this, this issue, and that is somewhere in the Bible it says it's easier for a new it's easier for a rich man to go through the eye of a needle than to go to heaven. And I would rephrase that. And I would say it's easier for a new South African journal to get international indexing than to achieve inclusion in the DH South African list. But I will leave it there. We can discuss that later. The second one is about author affiliations. There's been a, said a lot about that as well. We get a lot of, uh, well, let me first say, I think the, the, the explanation in the policy is quite clear, as good as it gets. But the, the application of that becomes difficult. We get a lot of requests from authors uh, during or after the peer review process to delete or add authors. And sometimes to the extent that we really start thinking that this is a gaming process going on. There's negotiation going on, who should be an author and who shouldn't be an author, and what affiliations should, should be used. Um, and that is why we introduced um, a declaration for all the articles that we receive, where the contribution of each author listed must be explicitly explained. Let us talk about the next one, and that's the 75% rule. And I see there was already a lot of questions in the chat about that rule. How do you apply that rule? Now, I must be very honest. It was, it was not easy for me as well in the beginning to get around this. Um, first, I thought that one should use a fractional uh, approach. In other words, every author, if there's more than one author, would get a fraction of the, of the, of, of the percentage of an article, so if there were three authors, each one would get 33%. And so you can go through all your articles, if there's one author, each one, the author will get 100%. And so in the end, you add up and calculate everything. And if, if uh, one institution has got more than 25%, then that's too much. Uh, but after a lot of discussion with the Department of Higher Education, I eventually discovered that they apply the rule very literal as it is in the policy. And that's why I said the wording is very important. It refers to emanate from multiple institutions. So the way the Department of Higher Education at the time that I had this discussions with them a couple of years ago, apply the rule is very simple. They look at the authorship and if there is the authors are from a single institution, maybe one or more authors, that would count for that particular institution. However, if there is one or more authors with one of the authors, at least one of the authors being from a different institution than the rest, that is counted as a multiple institution article. And that would not count for any particular um, institution. So in the end, it means that not more than 20, in practical terms, not more than 25% of the articles must be authored by only authors from that particular institution. So we can also discuss that later. Just a few remarks about that as well. It only applies to original articles or research articles. So the other types of articles can be uh, ignored. It only applies to the whole volume and not to particular issues. So we'll look at the whole year 
uh, and, and all the articles in that year must conform to that. And it also does not apply to journals uh, who are indexed in other indexes. So for instance, the Web of Science or Scopus, they've got their own criteria. These, the 25 or rather 75% uh, rule uh, specifically applies to journals on the DHET SA list. The final note, oh, and this particular rule causes a lot of problems for journals in small fields. Let's take the veterinary sciences as an example in South Africa. There's only one institution in South Africa that trains vets and one academic institution. Now, how on earth must they comply with this rule? Very problematic. Finally, let me briefly talk about the timing of journal inclusion because we also grapple with that quite a lot. So it may happen that a journal is um, included in a particular index. Let's say in April 2023, a journal will be indexed in Scopus. The question then arises, from when will the articles being published in that particular journal be approved for subsidy? And the answer we now discovered is that the Department of Higher Education gets a list from each index in the beginning of a year. The question to the index is, during the preceding year, which journals were uh, indexed in your index? And then that index will provide a list. Now, if the journal is on that list, that the articles published in that particular year will be indexed or will be approved for subsidy. And of course, in future, but every year, and that's why sometimes journals falls off a list. So it means that from that year in which the particular journal is indexed from that year onwards until it falls off, all articles will be uh, approved for subsidy. I think I will stop there. Thank you, Kian. Right, thank you. I, I did uh, indicate nuts and bolts, and I think uh, you've taken us right into the eye of the needle. We haven't gotten through it, but uh, <laughs> some of the points made there. So, okay, we've got about 40 minutes uh, left for discussion. We've got those three questions, but I think they've been addressed more or less, unless um, people want further clarification, which we may or may not be able to offer because these are issues that have to be discussed with a DHET, uh, and that, is a, that can be uh, a time-consuming and bu bureaucratic process. But I think they're important that we raise them in this forum so that they can be on the table and that we can shape this policy that it works for us better than simply in a very technocratic kind of way. So um, Louise van Hitten from uh, SF is the, is the uh, driver of the uh, Zoom meeting. Louise, have any questions? come in, in addition to the three that have been addressed in one way or another, or shall we go back to those questions? Uh, thank you, Kian. Yes, um, I think let's just go back to them. I can okay, mention can that uh, Johnny Peterson has asked a question. Uh, so we, um, there are five questions. If, if the speakers could have a look at them. Um, Susan, I think you could start off with the one from Johnny Peterson. Can you hear uh, me, Susan? Um, yes, I can. Thank you, Louise. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, perfect. Yes, thank you. Um, sorry, um, I don't have the names yet. I just made a list, actually, of all the questions. Um, um, Louise, perhaps just to, to save some time. I'm sorry, otherwise I have to dig into all no, these no. questions. But no, no, no. So, son, yes, it's fine. Um, it's uh, Johnny Peterson asks uh, when you refer to experts, um, experts evaluating the journals. Um, he was asking whether that's like an additional layer of reviewers because the journals now already reviewed the articles, and then you said that uh, when we, I um, mean, the ad hoc evaluations of journals, we also review journals. Uh, the journals are reviewed by experts. He was asking, he was asking for clarity on. The, your use of experts there? Um, yes, no, they're one and the same. When I said expert, it actually means the peer reviewers, which we assume 
is experts in the field to review the actual um, articles. Okay, fine, thank you. Um, the, there were, were questions about the 75, 25% rule, but uh, Pierre, you've explained it so well. You should have been a teacher or a lecturer. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, but even though um, people are, are welcome to, to also ask more questions that they have that. And um, yes, that's all I can see at this stage. Uh, Kian, would you like to um, see if there are any other questions that I might have missed? Okay, are there any other, other questions? You can put your hands up, uh, Louise, or um, home in on you uh, like a homing pigeon. Uh, <laughs> right, I see a hand from Brenda van Veek. Um, thank you so much, and thanks for a very really informative session. I would just like to find out, is there a specific interval at which journal are, journals are reassessed for accreditation? Right, Susan, I think that has to go back to you because this depends on the capacity and the scheduling within ASAF itself. Um, I can just say thank you, Brenda, for that question. Um, Reaccreditations and um, new applications are reviewed annually. It's an annual process. Thank you so much. Thanks. Can I ask um, the, 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 the panel assessments of journals that occur every five years, uh, Susanna, are those still? in the pipeline. I think we finished a whole batch of them over the past three um, or four. Yes, we have, have finished, coming through. That's right. We have finished all 320 journals just for interest. And the last report will be published in the next month or so. We it's busy with copy editing and, and layout, etc. And we finalized that one. And I think this is an important question, Kian, because it also brings us about um, the question Next is, is that the Department of Higher Education Training is envisaging a publications quality framework. And under that framework, um, there was a whole vision of who should be involved and what should be done. And in that publications framework, there's a lot of emphasis actually on um, research integrity and ethics, and of course, predatory publishing. So I think the department will tighten up um, so the rules and the criteria around um, journals specifically being published in South Africa. Um, so we're still waiting for that framework to be released. Um, within ASIF, we'll, we have to really um, think about how we're going to evaluate the journals um, in going forward. There has been a lot of criticism. Um, so I, I just absolutely find the remarks with both Labby and Pierre absolutely fascinating and critical and, and really a critical analysis of the policy itself and the implications thereof. Um, so I think it's very important that, that not only with NASA, but that we also um, share this with the Department of Higher Education and Training because um, yes, Labby, absolutely, when you start dissecting the words, um, you know, then you realize um, we've got some problems here because how do you practically, <laughs> you know, implement them and how, and how do you interpret them? So um, I really enjoyed the two presentations of our co-panel members because I think those are the actual critical questions um, we have to ask. Um, and later on, if there's time, um, Kian, I would um, then just speak a little bit about the ASAF uh, criteria to which Pia Referred, referred to, but let me just hold off on those. And um, there were a couple of other questions in, in the chat box as well. Um, um, so I'm not sure, I think what would be best is to give others perhaps an opportunity to also ask the question. And if I could add um, to link to the question you mentioned about that you're going to be answering from Pierre um, is what Neil van Gaan wrote. He, how is being listed on BHET's list of South African journals better or worse, if at all, than being listed, let's say, on Scopus or DOAJ in the South African context? In other words, why would an editor apply to DHET or accreditation rather than inclusion with Scopus or the DOAJ? Uh, 
Uh, Suzanne, do you want to answer that or perhaps um, uh, Pierre? Yes, please, Kian. Let's just give the, the other panel members an opportunity. Um, I will jump in if, if I feel it's necessary. Thank you. Sorry, Kian, did I hear my name there? <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, the question was. Uh, well, all right. Why, I, I've why heard the question. I, I've heard yeah, why the question. Would one, why would one apply for DA accreditation if you can mm. get DOAJ listing? Right. Okay, so I think in the policy somewhere there is a statement which encourages journals to apply for international indexing. That is, I think, the stated ideal of the policy. I think the DHET SA list was begrudgingly introduced by the DHET. They actually hoped that it wouldn't be necessary, but they realized it will be necessary because... Uh, the entry criteria in those international lists uh, is sometimes difficult for start-up small country journals. So I would say that uh, it's definitely better to be in one of the international indexes because you get a more international exposure for your journal. That is, I think, probably the most important reason. And as I explained, some of the requirements for a new journal to, to get on the DHET list is quite difficult nowadays. Uh, so I would say, um, if I had to make a call, I would say, yes, go for the DOAJ if you are an open access journal. The DOAJ um, uh, criteria are actually quite explicitly um, detailed. So that is the one positive thing about applying for DOAJ. You actually know what you need to do. It's all up there and you can comply or not comply with that. They even go as far as to, to tell you how many articles you need to publish in the year, etc. So whereas getting into the, the South African list is not so explicit, and in my opinion, uh, rests on the opinion of certain people, uh, the reviewers that they use for those journals. I've seen another question which is related to this. Uh, somebody asked, would a Kenyan Journal of Epidemiology uh, be, um, can they apply for a South African, for the SA list? Well, obviously, depending on the criteria, whether this is an African journal or not, I would say that probably wouldn't be one. Uh, they should go for the international indexes, uh, because if you are on the international index, South African authors will come to your journal and will get subsidy. Thank you, Kian. Yes, thank you. I think two points here. One is that the DHET system um, was supposed to be a kickstart to enable local journals to get on their feet. Uh, and once they had reached a level of stability and reliability to then apply to be on one of the international indexes. So there was supposed to be a kind of progression. But as Pierre has pointed out, a lot of the South African journals are in fact considered to be far too parochial uh, by any of the um, qualifying indexes to be included on them. So the yet system has therefore remained. Uh, secondly, with regard to what is a South African journal, well, that's uh, another issue that SF has been applying its mind to and uh, has released uh, a document defining what is a South African journal. Uh, and I don't think that the Kenyan Journal of Epidemiology would qualify. Um, and it all depends on, you know, where are the editors, who are the editors, which institutions are they uh, linked to, uh, what is the um, South African uh, ratio to international authorship in those journals. There are many such questions, and we get applications all the time from journals that, in fact, are not um, in the ballpark, but which want to be accredited, and we're constantly asking why. Um, whereas the easy option is to uh, get such a journal up and running and onto one of the international qualifying uh, indexes. Um, if a journal is published, as an editor in an edited book, can one submit it <laughs> uh, for a second subsidy of the journal article? The answer is no, because that's double dipping. Um, if it's uh, qualified on the first round, um, it's, it, it can't really qualify in the second round, although there's a, the, the gray area is if it didn't qualify in the first round, 
because the book wasn't recognized or wasn't submitted, will it qualify the second time around? Well, again, that's something that I think uh, the technocrats really have to, to answer. Lavi, I see that your hand is up. Uh, would you like to offer some? Yeah, I, I just want to just uh, respond to the whole idea about indexing of journals and so on, because, you know, the South African journals, uh, I think we all now in the higher education space, um, quite um, you know, clear about you know approval processes, accreditation processes, and that's part of a language towards quality and what quality means. And so, you know, um, if you're a South African journal, uh, surely it must be accredited within your own country. And so this brings about a level of confidence in the quality of the journal. It also brings around the accountability aspect of the journal through its re-accreditation processes. And I think that's a, that's a selling point of trying to be within a South African uh, established list of accredited journals. Yes, thank you. Um, okay, what would call, uh, Matukau asks, what would cause a journal to fall off the accredited list? Well, um, the five yearly panels that meet are the ones that evaluate journals on the basis of uh, DHET criteria um, and other questions also. Um, those questions perhaps uh, need to be rethought. I think there's been some discussion today about uh, making the evaluations more sophisticated. The methodology is now quite old and we do need to, to uh, refresh those and, and bring them into the digital age. Uh, but basically an inability to publish regularly although COVID, of course, uh, um, gets in the way, uh, but those things could be taken into account by those panels. Uh, failing to meet the, the DHIT criteria. Uh, reviewers of the journals during the five-year annual assessments, uh, concluding that the quality is not very good. Um, the breaking of the, you know, with this over-publishing their own journals, all these are kinds of issues that that come into play, which then might result in a recommendation by the ASA panel to DHET um, about removing the journal from the list, or in some instances, putting it on probation with the list of criteria to assist the editors to revitalize the journal in terms of international best practice. Uh, I should point out that these, uh, Decisions are sometimes appealed by the journals, and we um, deal with two or three, three or four of these appeals every year. And what we find is that the editors, you know, a change of editor sometimes makes the difference um, because there's a new energy, there's a new, there's a new focus, uh, there's a willingness to engage with SF's recommendations, and things are put into place, which then do um, realign the journal with, with best practice. And normally the, the probation period would be for about two years, but there have been instances where panels have uh, recommended the accreditation, DHIT has agreed to that. And sometimes that means if the journal is a South African journal, even if it's published by an international publisher, uh, that journal will fail because that journal's readership not so much the readership, but perhaps the authorship based at South African universities abandons the journal because they're chasing the money. Um, I think we need to rethink that kind of pecuniary perverse, as um, um, Suzanne put it, that kind of perverse response and help those journals through periods of distress, particularly through periods of probation, and help them get re-established on the list. Uh, and, and even those international journals might not be in the international uh, list because they are quite parochial in their, in their subject matter. And I don't mean parochial in a negative sense, I just mean the interest is national. Um, therefore, they're not going to get on the international lists. And if the authors abandon the journal, that journal will close. And that has happened recently. Sadly. Um, so I just also want to point out that as the chair of the new journals application committee, 
and the appeal committee that every application and every appeal is assessed by two independent referees from within the disciplines that the journal serves in the context of the wider committee. And those uh, analyses can be quite um, detailed and very effective in terms of identifying the outcomes that, that the committee would make. And again, the recommendation is fed to DHET, but DHET makes the final uh, decision. We don't make the final decision. Uh, with regard to the, uh, yeah, the 75, 25% rule from Adrian, um, this is something that we discussed oh, about eight or nine years ago when the 50-50 rule came in. Now, why did the 50-50 rule come in and why was it then adjusted to 25-75? This was because at that point, SF had engaged Crest at Stellenbosch, the and a monitoring and evaluation operation headed by Johan Mouton. And the work that they were doing was showing how the system, the South African journals were being gamed by both universities and authors and sometimes editors as well, uh, which is what Susan referred to in her presentation. So in order to manage that gaming, the 50-50 rule came in, but it didn't seem to make much difference to the gaming, it just went on. Uh, so the 25-75 rule came in as a means to regulate the misconduct within the DHET system. And now we sit with this problem, uh, for, especially for those who are local journals only and are not on any of the international qualifying indexes. We sit with this and Clinton from the uh, from a geography journal uh, has, sent us his calculations of whether or not, I think an early or perhaps the first number of that new journal transgresses this rule. And I'm not sure that anything we've said here today actually answers that. Uh, I think there's a 0.5% difference. Um, <laughs> maybe it's 0.5% over the 25%. Clinton, would you like to, to make a few comments here? I see, your, I see you next, okay, on, on the chat. Clinton, do, do tell us about your problems and how you think we can resolve them. Good afternoon, colleagues. Uh, thanks, Prof. Um, yeah, so Jogia is very new. We started in 2018 and only recently uh, got accredited on the 1st of January last year. Um, but uh, I mean, we've only got uh, this issue consists of, I think, seven articles. And um, the uh, colleague of mine and I, who were co editing the journal, I've now stepped down and, and she is basically at the helm because that was one of the requirements from DHET is that there needs to be a new editor-in-chief. So we did that. Um, but the way she's interpreted it is that, uh, you know, because the one article was written by three authors from one institution, um, then that would count three times. Um, whereas the way I'm understanding, having read the policy is that an affiliation is an affiliation. So in other words, if all three of them are from the one institution, it only counts once. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, if, if other people are interpreting it like that as well. Uh, Pierre, maybe you've got some response to that. We lost him. Um, yes, Kian. Right. Hello, uh, hello, Clinton. Um, yeah, I, I tried to explain now. I think uh, Louise was too uh, too good in her praise of me to, to say that my explanation was good. It clearly was not good enough. <laughs> um, yes, Clinton, you are right. Um, that particular article would count only once for that particular university because all three authors are from that university. If there was one author from another university, that article would not count for that university. It would count to the multiple group. Uh, and that is the key of understanding this. Uh, I struggled myself to understand this, but eventually Sandile Williams and I had a very good chat and he explained it very clearly to me. So in the end, uh, only articles where all the authors are from a particular institution will count for that institution. 
if the uh, if there's another author in a group, that uh, article would count to multiple, and in the end, only those articles that is fully counted for a particular institution. Let's say University A has got 25 or let's say uh, 26 out of 100 articles published in a particular volume. Uh, please note, not issues. There's another question that came about that. They don't count issues, they count volumes. So if, if that particular journal has got uh, 26 articles out of 100, that means the policy is not applied properly. But if it was 24, that would have been okay. <laughs> okay, then I'm just going back now to Adrian Tordler's comment about the veterinary field um, and, the, and the, the journal that he edits. There's only one, as, as Pierre said, there's only one veterinary institute in South Africa. This is something that we did raise I think with Mr. Williams that you just mentioned, uh, Pierre, um, four or five years ago, it took us a year to get a response. Um, and and, and the, the, the letter that went from ASAF was precisely to address this particular point, but in a wider context also, that with the emergence through mergers that were occurring at the time of mega universities like UKZN, like UJ, with multiple campuses, with replicated disciplines across those campuses, um, that, that the 50-50 rule then would simply exclude legitimate publication by research teams engaged across those campuses at a single mega university uh, as an example. So we, we've got the the, the micro example here of the veterinary institute and the macro example of a large institution with multiple campuses with replicated disciplines and authors working on similar issues within those um, within those within those within those campuses uh, this is something we really do need to put back on the table Suzanne uh, but we have to make sure that our editors are playing the game also so that if we can get this rule softened, that the predators are not going to come in through the back door and then results in a technocratic solution emanating again from DHET to control 10% of the editor body when 90% are actually playing the game. So does anybody else want to? Floyd, you've got your hand up, I see. Please um, do uh, please speak to us. Uh, sorry, Kian, it's me. It's um, you, that okay. Has, yeah, <laughs> that has gone through a transformation here, uh, and I'm sorry about that. No, I was just supporting sort of your ideas. Yeah. Um, I think this is important also because we're taking record of, of this um, proceedings so that we can, you know, when we engage again with, with the DHET, I think there are a number of issues that we should raise actually with them. So just confirming and agreeing. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Then um, we come to Blanche Victorious's comment about if an essay journal is listed on, for example, Scopus or the OAJ, then publishing in an essay journal guarantees international exposure. Why then does the head not limited subsidies to publications only in South African journals to support local journals? I'm going to hand over to, to Suzanne, but I want to make a point first. The point I made in my opening address is that the head does not subsidize journals. The journals are the missing link in the value chain. The journals are the ones that facilitate the 2.5 billion cross flow from DHET to universities. The journal editors working pro bono very often are the mechanism by which that transfer occurs. The authors earn DHET subsidy for the university. And unless the university internally has a policy to top slice a percentage of those DHET incentives for particular articles and books to the journals, the journals have to find their own resources if they're not university sp sponsored. So there's a big gap in the value chain in terms of the journals sustainability. Everybody benefits except the journals and the journal editors. So that's my point and I've made it repeatedly um, in SF uh, and DHET 
uh, venues. And in fact, there's an article published in 2019 that deals with this contradiction. Um, but again, let me come back to Susanna about the why are the internationally published authors subsidized in addition to those publishing only in South African journals? Um, I actually think um, that Pierre has answered that question. Um, Kian, unless you want to, um, some more probing into it to say that um, for the DHET, um, rewarding of, of the subsidies is actually just to promote South African research, mm -hmm. um, irrespective of where it's published, um, and not to support the South African Journal. So that's what you've also actually just been saying right now. Um, so, so that is the reason. It's really, and, and you know, I, I see a lot of comments actually in the box, and, and I think we've got to be very clear as to what is the purpose of, again, of the research output policy. It's really also to get the productivity, the research productivity of, of institutions up. And it's succeeding in that, but it is actually at the, at the um, detriment of the quality of research output um, happening. So therefore something else has to happen now to ensure that the quality is actually risen. But I think it's very important to understand you know, in, in many ways, the um, policy is actually extremely lenient. You know, not prescribing to institutions how they should actually use that money. So, I mean, there's a lot of criticism, and I don't want to go into that <laughs> that argument now. But you know, but it does sometimes goes into the pockets of the actual researchers. And, I mean, is that right? And again, there's no discrimination between publishing your article in the international or in the national journal. Um, so I think the the department is not that descriptive actually. And I think in going forward, and, and many times the DHET has said that to us, um, would you rather that we withdraw the um, subsidy? Is that what you would like to do? What is the um, higher education sector going to do if that block grant subsidy, remember it's a huge chunk of monies being put forward to um, universities um, to, well, it, it's not, again, it's not prescriptive what they do with that, but it does stimulate not only the growth of universities, but also the research output, because it does generate some funding. Um, so we have to sometimes think about the consequences. You know, if, if, we, we, if we push very hard for certain things, um, that there might be actually quite a bit of punitive measurements in the policy, which is also not to the benefit maybe of institutions. I, I don't know, I'm throwing a little bit of, a, of a, um, a rock into a bush. You know, I don't even think it's a stone. I think it's, it's quite a big rock and it's very debatable, um, you know, amongst us all. <laughs> you know, what does it mean? Um, thank you. Uh, I think no, I'll thank, yes, no, thank you. There's always the law of unintended consequences. Okay, the intention of the DHET system was to catapult South Africa globally. It's done that. And now we want to punish um, those authors who are now internationally published and would prefer to, to, to locate their, their work in, in those kinds of international journals, which might also be have South African bases. Secondly, if we only uh, support authors in local journals, there's then a dependency set up that we don't want to apply for international uh, indexing because that's going to uh, wipe out our access to the, to the DHET subsidy. And therefore we, 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 we wallow then in our parochialness rather than trying to interconnect. And I think if, we, if you look at the full list of 320 odd South African journals, very few of those actually are on any indexes, let alone the ones identified by, by DHET. Many indexes um, don't require payments. They don't require, you know, they're much more lenient, but you know, why are the South African journals not indexed on those journals, even if they don't uh, qualify the journal for, for um, DHET funding? How do we get exposure if we don't get onto those indexes? There's a myth that if you're on open access, that your readers will find you. They won't. They're not looking for you. Uh, they don't use the right words, search words. Uh, they might find you by accident. Um, you've got to market yourself. You've got to be on those indexes, on those lists that actually bring news of your articles to readers across the world. 
Let me stop that point there. I see Brenda Van Vek has her hand up. Um, thank you so much, Bob. Just two short questions from my side. Uh, are there any guidelines of the role and functions of an editorial board, how that should take place? Um, and secondly, the 2015 um, policy, are there any indications that there will be an update to that soon? Thank you. Uh, Susan. Okay, right. So I'm um, sorry, Brenda, the first one you asked whether, sorry, the second part was, is there any indication that there, that, that there will be an update? Um, well, um, no, not from our side, although we do ask questions for the new publications quality framework, whether there's an, a new um, policy being envisaged with that one, <laughs> but not for the immediate feature. Policies um, does not happen overnight. <laughs> Um, you know, it takes some time and some deliberation and some consultation. Um, in the past, the DHET has consulted quite widely and have solicited some advice on the policy as such. So I can imagine in going forward, you know, if there's a, a change in, in the policy, it would take a number of years. And, and your first question, sorry, Brenda, was? Um, uh, the roles and functions of the editorial board. Are they certain guidelines because that can vary quite quite a bit from journal to journal. Are there preferred um, roles and functions stipulated somewhere? Um, within the ASAP Code of Best Practice, there is a section on editorial boards, whether it's a sufficient that is debatable. Um, I am of the opinion that we should actually um, revise the Code of Best Practice. Um, just to be more explicit and you know, in terms of the advice we, we give journals um, of, uh, for editorial boards and other editorial processes and the matters as well. Um, but there are international guides as well um, where it stipulates what is expected actually from, from the editorial board. But in our code of best practice, um, there is a whole section on the editorial board. Thank you. Can, can I before I hand over to uh, uh, Louise, did you have your hand up? Um, yes, yes, uh, I did. I just wanted to give uh, Labby an opportunity. I see he had oh, okay, his I'm hand coming up. to him now. Okay. All okay, right. I just wanted to say, remind Susan that we uh, there have been two questions about uh, the support we give to uh, mm. new journals. Um, so if we could take that question at some stage. Um, thank you, Kian and Susan. Okay. Um, the, if you just trawl through the internet, let alone the SF website, which is a font of information, policies, best practices, research into South African public publishing, uh, every editor really that should be, the SF website should be prescribed reading. And we'll test you next year when we have this meeting again um, for this kind of information. But in addition to the SF website, there are sites like the Scholarly Kitchen, which reports on a daily basis uh, about these kinds of issues in terms of shifting patterns and practices and ownership and the uh, technologies and global publishing. There's the Committee of um, COPE, Committee of Publication. What is it, uh, Suzanne? COPE? Yes, which, it's COPE. C -O -P -E. yeah. Yeah. COPE, it deals with ethics issues. That's and they have, publishing ethics, yes. And they report back on appeals. And if you're a member of COPE, uh, and you have a troublesome author, you can deal with those issues in a very structured kind of way through COPE. And I think most of the big publishers are supporting these kinds of organizations. So there's a lot that we can circulate. Um, the, the Scholarly Kitchen, the last time I looked at it, it had something like 101 things that editors should know. Absolutely kitchen sink stuff that, that is fundamental to, to, to managing a journal on a daily basis. We'll see if we can find those. Um, Labi, uh, are you still with us? Um, yes, I am. I just wanted to make two very quick comments. I think um, the first one is really related to, you know, as you mentioned, the support to journals, because at the moment, you know, the, the cost of publications is enormous. Institutions don't provide funding sufficiently enough to cover a cost uh, for authors, as well as for the management and maintenance of the journal. 
So that's something that needs to be taken up at more seriously and engaged with the institution. I'm not sure how that will happen, but it is a, a thing that's emerging quite uh, substantial in the management, financial management of the journal. Uh, the second is that I really want to put uh, our finger on is the distinguishing um, characters between the editorial board and the journal management committee. And so while we have these two bodies and each of them seems to have you know, um, different roles or uh, whether they're similar or not, but perhaps to review whether we need both a board and a general management committee. My experience is that the management committee is more useful to the journal uh, than the editorial board uh, because um, they are down into the hands on uh, management of the journal. Uh, as well as in terms of managing, in terms of the policy prescripts. Yes, thanks. I think you, you raise a very important point. You know, with open journal systems, suddenly there's been an explosion of new journals. And I'm wondering whether, in fact, the editors or the managers or the owners of these new journals, especially those located at universities, have thought about the long term. Is that journal going to be around in 10, 20, 30, 40 years' time? Where is the content of that journal going to be as um, software systems change and have to be upgraded? How is it going to be archived? How is it going to be marketed? Uh, we often start journals, as we did in the 1970s and 80s, often on golf ball typewriters with photostat machines, uh, produced a whole, produced a couple of numbers, and then realized that, oh my goodness, we've got to get these things out to readers. And, and how do we protect the work of those who are publishing in it. And even the top journals that might be published by, for example, Taylor and Francis, if that journal ceases publication at some point because the readership has abandoned it, because Diet has withdrawn its, its recognition, because it couldn't get onto international indexes, because the editors got old and died and nobody replaced them, all of those articles go into a holding pattern and they disappear unless they pop up again on, on academic sharing sites. But bear in mind that a lot of scholars trust journals that are still publishing. They might not have that much trust in the journal that's no longer publishing. So there's issues of longevity, there's issues of sustainability, there's issues of capacity, of editor reproduction, uh, of up, upskilling the next generation of editors. You have to understand the history of that particular journal. Uh, these are issues that we really do need to take into account. Uh, which is one of the reasons why DHET has these rules about regular publication, length of publication, stability of publication, and they also ask about funding. Um, the question is quite vague, and it's not always clear how, how you know what is meant when editors reply. Uh, but we don't. We do need to to put these things on the table. In the case of my own journal, it's it's an international journal because it's. It's edited by, it's, it's indexed by the, the major international indexes, but we always submit ourselves to a local ASAF evaluation because that keeps us on our toes. And if we should lose, <laughs> God forbid, that in, international indexing, then we've got a fallback mechanism in South Africa that we, we, we return to being a South African journal as opposed to being an international one. But the process of actually working with the evaluation committee um, and Ne negotiating with them what we're doing can be a very um, lucid experience for us, you know, helpful experience, much as is that other uh, rating system, the NRF scientific rating, as, as awful as it is, uh, it does tend to require us to ask certain questions that we might not otherwise ask of ourselves and our practices because we're doing that work every day and therefore we lose sight of um, the bigger picture. So um, can I ask if there's any, if there's one more question and then I think we must, um, must bring this to a close. No other questions, I don't see any. Um, no, um, it's very important um, that we address the question again about new journals. Um, we have had two queries in that regard. So Sun, um, would you speak to that? how ASF supports new journals? Um, certainly, Louise. Um, let me just make a couple of remarks. So ASF do not provide financial support, not to new journals and not to any other journals. 
um, but how do we support then um, new journals in their sort of process or quest to um, accreditation? Um, we do assist by giving advice and looking at the journal, how it's been set up, etc. cetera. Um, if there's a website and so on. And then uh, we find also that editors have particular questions about their journals, but so it's mainly through advice we do support them to um, hopefully then reach the status of being accredited. Thank you. Yeah, if I can just go back into the history of this again, you know, in, in the mid 2000s, this particular committee tended to um, issue dictats. This was because it was the Wild West in the mid 1990s uh, to the early 2000s. There were all these journals all publishing out of different outfits, different ways, not following international procedure, or some of them were joined on the hit incentives, others weren't. It was a bit of a mess and they had to kind of get a kind of regulatory environment underway and they used the DHET previous subsidy system to do that. And I think they did that quite well. Um, so in the early days of this committee, uh, instructions were sent out, policies were published without consultation uh, with the editors or the, or, or the publishers. But that shifted over time because the editors have taken a, a greater interest in um, shaping the nature of the discussions, putting their particular concerns on the annual um, NSEF agendas. Uh, and that has resulted in the dialogue, the kind that we're having here today. Our, our, our question then is how do we actually dialogue, take this dialogue and now deal with the bureaucrats in Pretoria? That's more difficult. And it's time consuming as you've heard, and they have their agendas, we have our agendas, they have their policies, we'd like their policies to be more um, sympathetic to ours, but they've got, to, they, they, they've got to do the measurements and they've got to do, they've got the figures and they've got the, the you know, they've got, a, they, they've got the law that they have to work under. But so it becomes a long term interaction between us and DHET. And it also depends on who's at DHET at the time and whether they, in fact, understand uh, the, cons the concerns of our constituency, whether they're alert to them and whether they're prepared to engage them. So it can sometimes be a very pro productive relationship with the government department, but it can also sometimes be quite frustrating. As I said, the first letter that went from SF uh, took a year for uh, the head to reply on the 50-50 issue um, uh, and, 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 and what, you know, what, what qualifies. So, you know, if we, as editors, we're in this for the long haul. And, and I'd also like to get away from the earlier participation of delegates who simply came to protect their own interests. They didn't engage in discussion. They allowed SF to speak from the podium. Um, and then simply made notes and went back and worked out how this was going to affect their particular operation and their particular journal. Let's rather also, as we have been doing very effectively during this meeting, put the bigger pictures on the table. Now, I just want to say that I'm not trying to say that SF um, was instrumentalist in its early days. In fact, at the, for those of you who are at the physical annual meetings, um, in Cape Town and Pretoria, ASAF brought to bear all sorts of discussions, some of them off the wall, about how particular journals do open peer review, et cetera, et cetera. Just to provide us with the kind of globalized context of what is happening across the world in different disciplines, different journals, different regulatory systems, uh, and different uh, models. And those were very revealing. And I think that those debates have also resulted in a kind of softening of the SF position on many things to give us, give the editor some discretion. Uh, I've worked on South African journals where the editor simply thinks of themselves as a postmaster. The article comes in, you find two reviewers, you send them a tick box, they tick the boxes, it comes back, they say publish, they say don't publish. Uh, there's no substantive engagement with the article. And if the editor, if the Peer reviewers who are sometimes outside of the field say publish, they publish. Then comes the, the critiques. Now the editors are confused. I think that editors need to know that they have discretion, they have flexibility, that there are guidelines within which we all have to work because after all, we are accepting on behalf of our authors or the authors are accepting on our behalf, <laughs> taxpayers' money, the DHET, 
is the wild card. It's always in the background. You've always got to be accountable because of that DHET funding. And some journals are not accountable. Some journals still play the game, still play the system. Um, so just to finish off the, the meeting, uh, and thanks to all the people who are still with us, 64 of you, I just want to want to alert you to a particular book, which was um, debate, discussed, uh, written by Sean Miller from UJ called The Incentivized University. Sean did make a presentation um, at the last NSEF meeting uh, about the dangers of incentivizing research work and academics to do the jobs that they're paid to do in the first place. Okay, uh, there was a big debate between Sean and some of the delegates, Phelan Togevers in particular, who was the architect of the SF um, policy in conjunction with DHET. Uh, so there's, there's a kind of middle ground that we all need to be looking at. So uh, we'll, we'll include the URL. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an electronic book published by Springer. I think it's available through your university libraries if they subscribe, but we'll send you the URL. And I think it's very worthwhile looking at it. He doesn't discuss the South African situation, does Sean, but he does discuss issues of incentivization and the consequences of that in a global context. So let me thank finally the SPP staff, Louise in particular, um, Susan, all the others who make these kinds of things happen. Uh, we'd certainly be, I think there's a there's an evaluation that they will have sent you. Please do fill that in when we send out the documentation, including my SWOT analysis with which I introduced the program. Please do respond. Um, add things, take things off, criticize. Uh, let us know what you think. Let us build policy together uh, because that strengthens our interactions then with the Department of Higher Education and Training. So I think it's now past. Uh, well, it's pretty, pretty much close to, to the end. Uh, does anybody have one final statement to make? Otherwise, we can close off. Merci. Uh, Kian, okay. could we possibly have a few moments to speak to the uh, matter of new journals? Yes, okay, did, I, did we not address that? Okay, please. Oh, please. No, no, I know you are you under, you, you're handling, you're juggling a lot of balls. <laughs> um, well, I will, SF doesn't fund journals. Oh, yeah, it's just, journals. Yeah. Universities uh, will have to fund journals if that is the case. And okay, the point I had intended making now that you remind me is that SF is not a regulatory outfit. We, we, we interpret state regulations and try and work with journal editors to ensure that they meet those criteria. So we, as Suzanne said, we offer advice. Uh, you can send letters to us, we'll respond to them. Um, we can help you uh, think through what you're doing, but we don't have any resources ourselves as SF to sponsor journals, although Skylo, perhaps that's what you need to discuss, discuss what is the Skylo or the Kulisa journals? How do those work in terms of new journal applications? Um, yes, well, in terms of Kulisa, um, a journal needs to be on Cielo to be able to um, become, to make use of the Kulisa option. Um, but uh, a journal can contact us and we can speak about it um, in, uh, because we do have some other plans um, in our plan. Okay, well, I think we should make this uh, you know, a theme for a forthcoming uh, meeting, new journals. Um, and support that can be expected from the national and university systems. Too much to go through now because now we've got 30 seconds left. So let me thank everybody for their presentations and please do write to us, do comment on the short proceedings that we'll send out. And thanks for all the, the good wishes from all the uh, delegates. So let me say goodbye.